Welcome back to the Social Seller Podcast with Connor Paulson, where we interview the world's highest quality communicators, professionals, business owners, creatives, and everything in between. It doesn't matter what industry you're in, if you're a high quality communicator, there's a good chance you're living a lot happier life, but you're also bringing those opportunities into your life almost like a magnet. My guarantee is that on this show, we only interview people that I, one, look up to, and two, that I know are going to continue to kill the game for years to come, and I want to make sure they're on your radar. But what I've learned is by asking the best questions, questions, we get the best responses, and that's what the highest quality communicators, our social sellers are all about. Let's hop inside to the Social Seller Podcast. Good morning. Welcome back to the Social Seller Podcast with Connor Paulson. We have a special guest today, someone that I guarantee you will learn more than you have on any other Monday. Uh, we'll put it that way. We're about to dive into the metaverse. Someone that I look up to, I'm just going to go in and dive in. This is Steve McGarry, a Web3 influencer, and we'll talk more about what Web3 is. He's the CEO and founder at Sandstorm, a marketing and education company within the Sandbox, helping bring more builders and creatives into the Sandbox metaverse ecosystem and helping get the attention and visibility that these companies and projects deserve. He's a very humble guy, and you'll realize that. But when you do some diving into YouTube, you see that he's shared stages with some of the coolest people in the space, Tom Bilyeu. I know we, right before this, we were talking about Gary Vee. I don't know if you've shared stage yet, but I know that'll be sometime this year. And the names and the list go on. Now, what's really interesting is you're creating and building this metaverse, and you come from a background in tech, right? You started a, a fintech company that you sold in 2015 to... The founders of PayPal are the current founder of PayPal in the past six years have been fully devoted in Sandstorm and the metaverse and crypto. Does that sound accurate, Steve? And welcome to the show. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And I couldn't have said it better myself for sure. That was well done. Very well articulated. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So just to dive in now, I've only really been diving into the metaverse for the last few weeks. I've been fascinated by Web3. And to me, Web3 is crypto, it's NFTs, it's Web3 domains. And what does all of this mean? What is Web3? Yeah, great question. So a lot of people listening to this, uh, depending on when you were born, you may remember Web1, which was effectively just reading. You could just go onto the internet, you could read a page that had some information, and AOL chat kind of came out where you could come up with your own kind of goofy username and start messaging people. And web two was the ability to publish content. So people could actually start publishing and putting content out into the internet and others could interact. And it started to really kind of take shape around this content creation piece. Now, what we've seen happen is with web two, this content is free to make, it goes out there, but the ownership of that is owned by, let's call it a handful of companies, maybe 10 companies at most, you know, your Google, your Facebook, all these big companies. So web three is a decentralization kind of movement around the, the future of the internet that's owned by the users, the people that are creating that content, not those 10 individuals that just own everything. It's based on the, the individuals like yourself, uh, like everybody out there that's listening. If you create something, you should own it. You should have the rights to you know future royalties. You should see people be able to enjoy that content long-term and own that art that you're creating. And that's kind of where the, the movement of Web3 is. Very exciting. And when you're saying the ownership, this ownership can look like anything digital, right? So we talk about NFTs and NFTs, I'm still trying to wrap my head around. You know, we saw the first kind of wave in, in the profile pictures and the art. And, and now you see a lot more focused in the utility, meaning, yeah, you can pay a lot of money for these NFTs, but what, what do you actually get within it? Does it get you access to certain groups? Does it get you access to partnership rights? Is there the ability to maybe make reoccurring revenue from it in some form or way? Um, what do you see as the most common types of NFTs? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that there, there's been a lot of really eloquent um, descriptions of, of what NFTs are going to become and where we're at. 
And in my opinion, I think in the future, it's going to be all in the background. Like th this is something that you're not going to interact with directly as you do today. It's just going to be something that's really quickly uh, integrated into the back end of, of websites as you know them today. So for example, with the PFP projects and for people that don't know what that is, it's effectively these collections of images that were generated from random different character traits, applying rarities to them. So it was like, you know, if I'm wearing a blue hat and uh, a red shirt, those two, uh, you know, attributes have a rarity because over the 10,000 profile picture images, there's two of them, let's say. So then there's different rarities and it became this quick, uh, quick movement. And this really sparked with a project called Crypto Kitties. A lot of the founders that are out there building the most innovative tech right now, if you look back to Crypto Kitties, about, I'll say 20 or 30 different of the top founders now got into NFTs from Crypto Kitties. And really? that was the original kind of image to visualize what an NFT could be. And it was this playful kitty with all these different attributes. And everybody was like, wow, this is, this is really uh, something that the blockchain could be used for is just these images. What else could that be used for? And then people said, all right, well, let's make some art and put it on there because for more of the tech minded individuals out there, storage capacity on the blockchain is very small. It's very difficult to to store a bunch of information, uh, like especially the images, video, and things like that. So art was a static image that could go up. And remember when I was mentioning about Web 1 earlier, these static images are like the 1995 internet. They're basically mm -hmm. where you just look and you just see in front of you, this is a me consuming information, just like Web 1, where I could read an, an article or something. And this is kind of how I see where we're at with NFTs in they're going to take shape into amazing things over the next 20, 30 years. Everything will be run on them because the person who's publishing them wants to own the rights to those and be able to transact. So that's kind of where the, the profile picture movement begun around the static images, the applying rarities to them, people trading them. And now we're seeing more complex things come out. It's really exciting. Um, a lot of different things around certificates, around you know a lot of cool things in real estate happening, all sorts of uh, you know licenses, things that can be proven and verified who they began with. Like fashion is a huge one where there's no more knockoffs that are existing in the digital world, and. All of this boils down to, you mentioned ownership, Connor, and, and that is probably the core baseline of what Web3 is about, is people being able to own their creation. And this is something that is, is kind of difficult to, to wrap your mind around because a lot of people want to be able to point to someone and say, hey, I lost this. You need to give, you need to support me and give that back to me. And it's this uncomfortable shift that happens where you have to take responsibility over what you've created. And if you lose it, you lose it. <laughs> and, and the ownership movement is really fascinating to watch how it's, how it's moving into music. It's moving into uh, entertainment with movies and all these different industries. And it's just slowly gobbling up all of these individual industries around the creators being able to own what they've what they've created. Wow. And, and so it spans from any type of creator. And I like that you were purposely using very ambiguous, ambiguous terms, right? Because to me, a, a creator could be someone that goes into a metaverse and plays like Minecraft and you can create some type of house or an experience. But we're also talking in terms of a, a current music artist, right? You, anyone listening, you love Alicia Keys and she could be dropping a, an album in some format of an NFT to help bring her fans and, and community even closer. And there might even be ways that, that her fans are, are making some money at the end of the day too by supporting, right? So it could happen in that. And I'm sure it happens in video games and it's spanning from any type of creative in, in any arena. Would you say that this Web3 world 
in us kind of being in the first few steps of it in the grand scheme of things could could be more valuable. I guess the other, where I wanted to go with this, Steve, is how do you see a world in the next few years where virtual ownership of things could be more valuable than in the physical world and specifically land? And I've read a couple articles where they're talking in the next few years, and I can't wrap my head around it, but where could it be more valuable to own land in the virtual world? Where, yeah, how, do, how is it more valuable than the physical world where I could see it, I could touch it, I could build something? Could you help yeah. us understand that? Yeah, and a lot of this has to do with where attention is currently and where it's going. And this is something that can be tracked with the future generations. So when you look at Gen Z, on average, Gen Z, which is the one right after millennials, spends eight hours a day online. Now, if you look at, let's call it the uh, you know, Gen X or the, the boomers, they are nowhere near that level of attention online. I, I don't know what the figure is there, but it's a fraction of an eight hour uh, you know, increment of time on the internet. Now, when you have an entire generation of humans that spend eight hours out of their day connected online, generating content, consuming content, you have uh, a shift in where value is. And when you look at the things that people are doing now, where they're spending all this time online, they're producing content that they don't own uh, while, while they're publishing it, unless it's on Web3, there is a, a very important, subtle uh, change of what's going on in the physical world and what's going on in the digital world, where if I work every day on the internet, the value I'm extracting from the virtual world is greater than the physical world. And that kind of quick little mindset shift of where are you extracting how you, how you survive as a human, the moment that society really starts to think, okay, I can, I can actually make a full-time income through the digital world. So therefore I value that greater than than my my physical surroundings and of course you know that's a little bleak and very ready player one like where you're just you know kind of sitting on the couch wearing a headset and just <laughs> ordering food and everything coming to you you never move around there is a balance and there's a lot of really cool research being done on mental health right now uh, around people that are just connected all day every day extracting value all of their um, you know, job is, is focused in there. So the, the short answer to that is where, where do people pay attention, the length of time they're paying attention, and where do people extract their uh, incomes from? And where do they produce that value? So that's kind of the, the boiled down version of where I think society is shifting. Um, and it's, it's hopefully shifting in a direction where people actually can own what they're putting, putting into the market online. Absolutely. And would you say that people that might be following some of these trends and, and also get excited about innovation and kind of seeing the future being created in front of them, that do these early adopters have financial rewards by getting into some of these, you know, these opportunities today, or, or at the same time, is there just so much risk that you know, nine out of 10 projects are going to fail. Make sure you're, you're, you put your money where, where it's smart. What would you yeah. say? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, definitely not financial advice by any means, of course, but you mentioned land earlier um, and the value there and how people are attaching value to those. If, you know, I have a, a house that's in the metaverse and I want to have an art party within my house from all my favorite artists all over the world, um, I think I could go around and I could buy up all of my favorite art immediately integrated into my house and have people from all over the world attend, hang out with me, 
and to talk about things in inside my virtual world house. People in Japan are standing across from me. People in uh, you know Russia are hanging out, and we're all just kind of talking about the art. And this type of uh, lower barrier to entry than catching flights all to one house in the middle of let's call it uh, the U.S. in Denver or something. I don't know. Yeah, that lowest lower barrier to entry allowing people to come in and, and your ability to communicate and connect with others has equity in it like that that has value so the early adopters can and will uh, reap a lot of benefits and with crypto there are two people that win in crypto now i've been in the space since 2013 bought my first Bitcoin in January of, of 2013. And the two people that win in crypto are holders. So people that buy and just sit on it and hold and founders, the people that are starting businesses and companies in the space. Now that's leaving out one very key one that everyone hears about. The people that get wrecked and lose the most are traders. Now, nothing against traders out there. I, I respect everyone, all of my friends that are day traders and uh, crypto traders, but 99% of people that are going to be trading are going to get wrecked. Um, and newcomers that come into this space, you can start a company or you can simply buy an asset and sit on it and learn more about it and get more deep into it and get excited about it. And that is what I, I believe every newcomer of our generation that's learning about this, because there's no more important asset class, in my opinion, no more will be able to, to generate either this level of, of generational wealth. It's just nothing else. <laughs> it's the best performing asset class in the last decade. And there is no other uh, place to spend attention on, in my opinion, <laughs> than uh, the metaverse and, you know, crypto at large, but that's kind of a, a quick, quick overview of at least where I see the, the early adopters gaining the most momentum and the ability to just set it and forget it. Just <laughs> don't, don't worry about it. it it'll, it'll, it's going to change the world. There's brilliant people working on this day in and day out. So it's just trust that you're doing by sitting on uh, these assets. Yeah, exactly. I love that you say that. You can't lose money if you if you hodl, right? If you hold, you can only lose money when you're taking money out. Um, and where where is the metaverse today? And you're gonna, you know, the two most popular, and, and from my understanding, the two largest metaverses are the Sandbox and then Decentraland that have both been out the longest. Now, it sounds like the big brands are putting a lot of money into these two in particular. Yeah, it seems like every day I'm hearing about 50 new metaverse lands that are being created. In a place where it seems like there's so much noise everywhere, what is the important stuff to pay attention to? Or what because you've been through this wave and since 2013, can you help give me a little context for not getting the flashy eyed syndrome? Because there's always new shit coming out. And what, what stays true to you, almost like the 80 20 rule? What is the 20% important shit that you keep your eyes on? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I've been very, very fortunate. Uh, and I'm grateful for, for all of the rooms I've been in, all the conversations I've had. Um, and it, it boils down to who is building what, what you're interested in. And that kind of comes to what you mentioned, Sandbox and Decentraland. Part of the reason that we're, you know, I started a, a business last year called Sandstorm. Uh, part of the reason that I, I chose to go with Sandstorm is uh, I've met Sebastian, the, the founder of it. I've met their team. I've talked to all these different departments of Sandbox. I think in my email, I have like 10 different team members at Sandbox that I've talked to individually on calls to get to know them. And they're the real deal. They're not, um, 
new to gaming. They're not new to creating these kind of MMORPG kind of concepts. And with gaming specifically, th this is just the, the tip of the iceberg. And that's a huge tip <laughs> of the iceberg. But virtual events where everyone go is going to congregate in the future to, to have conversations, to be in the presence of others. Because right now, I I, I love talking to you, Connor. This is a fantastic interview, but it would be so cool if if I was looking at you not on Zoom. If I could, you know, see your your body movements and and your read your, read you a little bit better than just kind of through this flat screen. And the metaverse is going to give that utility to us. So people that have proven track records is the first data point that I would recommend everybody looks at when you're looking at um, any kind of project, any virtual world, any NFT, any cryptocurrency, anything like that. Look who's building it and look at the backers, see who's supporting this um, level of development. And I would also say, look at the community, the people that are rallying around this, that believe in the team, they believe in the, the future of what it could be because they determine it, <laughs> essentially. The, the community, the, the team can go so far, but if nobody's interacting with this tech, then you, you kind of fall off. So it's like a three-legged stool. If one of them, one of them falls off, uh, you, you can't stand. So it, I do believe that those three are kind of, at least what I have experienced to be the most valuable um, contributions from each, each one of those legs of the stool. And community, especially in NFTs, has become the most important tool, even surpassing team. Because sometimes, I mean, look at Dogecoin and Shiba Inu, these meme tokens where the community controls what's going on um, entirely. So, you know, similarly with DAOs now kind of buying different assets and things like that, community run funds effectively just taking control. Uh, I believe that each one of the legs of the, the kind of diligence stool, we could call it, each one of those has a different weight to it. And I think with NFTs right now in the, I'll call it the 1995 of the internet stage for NFTs, maybe 1993, because in, in 1995, I think there were 50 million users of the internet. We're nowhere near that yet. Nowhere near that easily less than 2 million, I'll call it, um, for the entire space right now um, in, in terms of the at least NFTs and the metaverse and everything. So super, super early. I know everybody says that, but <laughs> it's just true. It's just fundamentally true. Uh, so yeah, I think that, that that kind of answered the question in a bunch of different ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and the same thing that I, I continue to hear is grasping how this technology and technology continues to grow at compounded rates, right? And that's a very difficult thing for a lot of us to comprehend um, that it's not growing at a, in a stagnant, a stagnant rate, right? That it's, it's a bell curve or it's, you know, it's accelerating and seeing these things come together. How does Sandstorm come into the mix here? So you started the company last year. What, what, bridge to sandstorm represent yeah yeah and, and for further background and context for for everybody listening um you know after i after i sold my my fintech company that was basically giving students loans to learn uh software development so it was a peer-to-peer -peer lending company uh, for whatever reason in past life i guess i just didn't like banks uh so i uh, we raised a bunch of money and people were going through these coding boot camps that are 12 week programs that they learn programming and they get a job, very low risk profile for the individual investor. They got their loan and uh, we had an innovative kind of solution that allowed us to lend to more people with higher risk profiles. And um, that was kind of my, my entry point in peer to peer. And I think that moving past that, after I exited that, we started a company that grew to be the eighth largest landowner in Sandbox. And that uh, last year, we determined, okay, 
we're going to have a couple different departments in this company. I'm going to step aside and I'm going to start up a sandstorm around education. And there's just this huge delta between all the echo chamber that's existing within the space and the rest of the entire world, uh, billions of people that have no idea what this, what this stuff is, why it's important to have this ownership, why it's, uh, you know, the future of where generations are going to meet, learn, transact, just live their lives. Um, and it's just so important to, to open that up. So we started and I believe it was August of 2021 started it once every two weeks, having these live events quickly got just overwhelmed by demand, moved to once a week. And fast forward to today, we're about to shift to four times a week next week, uh, just because of the overwhelming amount of people that want to come on and talk about what they're building. And we developed a platform that allows people to buy the NFTs that people are talking about on the stream. So if this was on the Sandstorm platform, I would say, go below you and purchase an avatar I made of Connor. <laughs> standing, standing in the metaverse and you can buy it below the stream. So kind of connecting all of it together and weaving together what I think is the future of education for Gen Z and Gen Alpha, the one after uh, Z. I love that, Stephen. Anyone can go to the sandstorm.co website, right? You don't need a, an Oculus goggle headset to into the metaverse. For anyone that has never experienced sandbox or a metaverse, can they go to your website and and kind of see what what this looks like? Yeah, so we're we're in like a an alpha. We're in like a kind of a, a private alpha stage, but you could definitely go on there and check it out. Um, it's not not ready for prime time yet. We are going to be launching um, in the next probably month and a half or so, and very excited for all the people we have lined up on the platform. So right now it's kind of a test platform that people could check out if they want. And three times a week, soon to be four times, you're gonna be able to watch this content of us interviewing the best builders of the metaverse. And you can watch it right there. You can connect your web, uh, your web3 wallet, which is MetaMask that we use, which is very easy, uh, but there's you know a how-to page so that you can kind of understand how that works. We're gonna have a lot more tutorials coming out on how MetaMask works, how to download that on your browser, um, how to store private keys safely, how to store uh, you know, crypto safely, and just the basics. We'll have all that available very soon uh, for people on the site. But yeah, people can go and play with it, beat it up, and uh, give us some feedback. It'd be great. I love it. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of like the QVC, right? It, it's a one of its kind. So. Uh, you're bringing so many multiple, you're bringing multiple valuable things together, you're bringing founders, creating and building, owning land to show off and attract, you know, new people to come experience this. There's the ability to, to buy right there in these live interviews, but then there's also the Twitch stream that's happening that's showing you what they're doing in the metaverse to actually get an idea. And, and that helped connect a lot of dots because, you know, just a few weeks ago, I was intimidated to kind of dive in or experience the metaverse because I didn't think I had the technology or I just thought it'd cost a lot of money or it, like there were gas fees or something. And until going to, you know, the Sandstorm YouTube channel and, and website, starting to see this stuff, it, the dots are starting to connect. Um, I, I've also said on the show that I think owning an Oculus might be one of the smartest investments for R&D right now in the world, knowing they're going to get a lot better but at least getting to, to access and kind of taste a little bit of ready player one. Would you agree? Yeah, I think um, we're going to get so advanced with this that in terms of the community as a whole um, with NFTs and the metaverse and everything that I think Oculus being owned by Facebook um, and Meta, Facebook slash Meta. I think our generation is always going to know them as Facebook, but maybe future generations will right. know them as just Meta. Um, I think there's there's a couple different points here around decentralization. So, for people that are brand new to that word in general, 
Um, basically, centralization means that one party can control the permissions of what's going on. So like a, a bank has to approve certain people for accounts, transactions, uh, you know, loans, things like that. Decentralization is where people work together to, you know, verify someone is who they say they are, and you can do it in a permissionless way. And I won't go into like all the nitty gritty of, of how that's, that's done, but with the metaverse, meta is uh, in, in what everybody's kind of referring to it as is the example of centralization where on, on the far, we'll call it far left-hand corner, you have uh, centralization. On the far right-hand corner, you have the decentralized metaverse. And this is where people access it under a fully owned by its citizens and users, um, fully owned and, and governed by them. Now, everything being built on Ethereum, and uh, I know a lot of other chains are trying to get involved with it, but Ethereum is quite decentralized to a certain point. So things that are being built on there are more likely and are owned by those citizens and those users. Meta, Oculus slash Facebook, um, that is going to be owned and governed and controlled by Facebook and, and, and Mr. Zuckerberg. So you have this spectrum. Now, I think that there's, there's a, a place for everybody on that spectrum and it's what's important to you. And that's kind of the magic that we have the ability to decide what's important. So of course there's middle grounds. And I think that for beginners, you know, you can get something like an Oculus and get involved and, and see what this virtual world could look like. And then as you kind of uh, get a little bit deeper into, you know, the ownership components and, and being able to, to own a portfolio of different virtual world real estate and things like that, you can kind of pick and choose you can figure out like, okay, who controls this virtual world? How many people are involved in this? Um, you know, how is it governed? How are decisions made? Is it, do I submit a proposal and then the entire community votes on it? And then we get approved to build this mega skyscraper because we've all thousands have approved it. And it's, it's such a, a, a large spectrum and a deep rabbit hole <laughs> that I would encourage anybody that's listening to, to do some research on the decentralized metaverse um, and just how, how early it, it is on, on that front. Absolutely. What, what resources would you recommend in general for anything that comes to the top of your mind, whether it's a book, a YouTube channel, um, anyone yeah. where you can dive down that rabbit hole? Let me think. Uh, sandstorm. I think that would be good. <laughs> sandstorm. Yeah, exactly. Just hop onto the streams. Uh, um, no, no, I think that there's there's plenty of great YouTubers out there. Crypto Stash does a good job. Um, near friend of mine. And we've been making content together for, for many years. He was actually on, I think, the, the second stream we ever did from inside Sandbox. And Sandstorm was the first ever social hub experience within Sandbox, which is a claim to fame that I'm very proud of. Things were breaking, audio shut off multiple times, but we did it on the 1st of September uh, last year to be the first ever uh, multiplayer like social experience where everybody could come together within that metaverse was an honor uh, to be able to to have that and stash was there so check his channel out i think they're doing a lot of great things um, i know bitboy ben over there does a huge operation and a good friend of mine they're doing cool stuff in the metaverse New Money Gang, they're a fun uh, channel. My buddy Justin over there uh, works on that channel and they do a lot of um, really cool side hustle content and they also do metaverse um, content. So there's a lot of good resources and note that I mentioned YouTube primarily and that is because you're dealing with individuals. You're dealing with the individual thought leader that's communicating with you directly and 
this is something that I believe is the future of education, where the builders, the people that are creating things and have done, they've taken the action, like yourself, Connor, you know, you going out there and talking to an audience of people, that's who you want to listen to. That the people that have that executed and done it, listen to their content, raw, uncut, un, unedited. Um, listen to that, learn from that. That's how I, I see the future of minds being shaped. And I think emphasizing that is, is very important. So YouTube right now is where I recommend people get that, that, that footage, um, from, from teachers that have done things. <laughs> I love that. And I love how you put that there because I've found myself just naturally leaning towards once in a while, I read the medium articles and more of like the white paper, the how to's, but YouTube traditionally, and, and you explained it in such a transparent, easy to understand way, but that's absolutely why. Right before we hopped into this interview and, and to kind of bring it all together here at the end, you talked about something that Gary Vee mentioned a couple of years ago. I don't know if you were together with him at an event, but it was on the idea of content and how important content is today. But I know how important content is for Sandbox or Sandstorm and Sandbox. But over the next couple of years, what role does content play in if a company is going to be around in Web3? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, like I was, I mentioned at the very beginning of the interview when, when uh, we talked about Web1, Web2, Web3. I think that web two showed the value of content creation, you know, on YouTube, people could start publishing all this hard earned or hard time consuming content, hours of editing goes into a video, it gets published and you make a, a you know, a couple of pennies per thousand <laughs> views. So with web three, owning what you've just spent hours and hours doing and publishing that out there and earning uh, your rightfully earned uh, income from that plays into what I, I, I really like what Gary Vanderchuk said um, a while back. I don't remember if it was like a year or two ago, but basically a company is only going to be as successful as its emphasis on content and being able to consistently publish content build out a ongoing community of people that are like-minded, interested in what you're doing and treating them with respect, providing value to those other human beings on the other side of the camera, I think is a very brilliant way of looking at the future of business. Um, because like we talked about as well, attention is going to content online, eight hours a day with Gen Z, Gen Alpha, I'm assuming, is going to be 20% or more higher than eight hours. And you're going to see big companies become irrelevant because they are not focused on getting and staying in the, the feed of Gen Z and Alpha. So that's kind of how I see where business is shifting. Everybody should have a content schedule. Everybody should be doing amazing interviews like you do on, on your channel and, you know, being able to get into the social contract of a, an interview. So now Connor and I have this cool little bond here. That is this piece of content that we're both wrapped into. We've both invested about 30 minutes of time, which gives this interview the value of our time. And that's baked into this interview. Now where this is published determines who gains the, the value there? Uh, does Connor as the interviewer uh, gain that value? Is it YouTube? Is it you know one of the streams out there that's gonna have this content on there? So the ability to, to create content is very, 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 very important. If not the most important that all businesses should be focused on for future generations. So um, that was more eloquently put by Gary Vaynerchuk, but. I, I really agree that you need to focus on where future generations are looking and listening <laughs> and creating. It, exactly. Marketing 101, right? They, it, we want to spend time with where our ideal demographics hang out and where they spend the most time, right? And 
20 years ago, we were talking about the physical world. So you wanted to go target someone. Oh, well, they go to church on Sundays. So maybe I go there and maybe they go eat at this place on Tuesdays. Now we're talking about the virtual world, baby. And there are virtual worlds, metaverses created, creators doing this and it's all around us. So Steve, thank you so much for your time. I know you are an extremely busy guy and, and uh, appreciate you being able to come on. You provided some unreal value. And for anyone wanting to learn more about Sandstorm, everything you're building in Sandbox and the metaverses, and it sounds like a lot more to come, where can they learn more about you, Steve, and, and the company? Yeah, yeah. So definitely YouTube. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, Web 2 does bridge to Web 3 the, in order for people to kind of come across <laughs> from Web 2 into Web 3. We publish on uh, all the major platforms regularly. We emphasize content heavily. Uh, so YouTube is a great channel where you can watch all the great interviews with these builders that are creating incredible things in the virtual world. And uh, yeah, give us a subscribe on there. Give us a like and uh, check out all that content. Beautiful. And we will include the links below in the description. Steve, thank you again. Any last statement or, or some, how can we build some excitement? What's a statement that gets you excited about the metaverse? I'll, I'll leave everybody with a good mind melter. Uh, so uh, I'm, I've spoken multiple times to the founder of a company called 4K, and it's a company that backs NFTs with physical goods. And they're trying to really have this backed, uh, you know, physical to digital concept. And one thing that I talked to him about that I really wanted to mention here <laughs> is he believes in the future, people are going to only do things in the physical world to have them in the digital world. So it, it, it's a fun thought to leave everybody with of, you know, me starting a farm just to back all my, <laughs> all my farm vegetables and everything with physical or with digital uh, rep, replicants of that. But a little bit of a, a, a trippy thought, but it's a fun thought experiment to think about only doing things physically to get them digital um, and backing those items in the digital world. Working hard in the physical to live it up in the, <laughs> in the metaverse. I love it. Steve, thank you again. We will see you on the inside.